If I were to uh, ask how many of you know who Scott Peck is, would you be able to tell me? Uh, how many of you think he might be a professional golfer? How many of you think he might be an up-and-coming Southern California politician? How many of you think um, he might be a nationally known real estate broker? How many of you think he might be a psychiatrist? If you said psychiatrist, you'd be right. Not my psychiatrist, but um, a psychiatrist nonetheless. In fact, uh, in 1988, Scott Peck wrote uh, one of the best-selling books, um, uh, Road Less Traveled. But he also wrote a second book, Glimpses of the Devil, a psychiatrist's personal accounts of possession. But he waited over two decades to publish this book because he figured his fellow psychiatrists would laugh him out of the profession. And he was probably right because at the time, about 99% of psychiatrists admitted to not believing in the devil. And he figured uh, they would question his sanity when he said something like this in, one, in the book Glimpses of the Devil. He wrote, I acknowledged that demons could sometimes speak the truth, but it was always in the form of a half-truth. Indeed, half-truths were the devil's most common weapons. So you can see why he thought his fellow psychiatrists might question his sanity. But Scott Peck was right when he treated the unseen world as real. Because that's what the Bible does. The Bible treats the unseen world as real. And no one more so, perhaps, than the gospel writer Luke. The, the, of the four gospel writers, uh, he, he was a doctor, the only doctor. And as a doctor, he consistently made a distinction between those who were ill, diseased, and those who were influenced by the demonic. For instance, in Luke chapter 7, verse 21, we read, At that very time, Jesus cured many people of their diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. And then again in Luke chapter 8, verse 2, he had taken his disciples with him in verse 1, along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. He understood the difference. And last week, we looked at one of Luke's accounts uh, of Jesus encountering the demonic, of Jesus encountering the unseen world, to uh, continue our series sermon, sermon series on the best life, what the Spirit of God can do in our lives that the devil doesn't want. And last week, we looked at a story in Luke chapter 8. And in that story, we discovered four of the things that the devil does want to do in our life, including he wants to control us. He wants to help us destroy ourselves. He wants to ruin our relationships. He wants to undermine our relationship to God. And you may remember we talked about our lives being like a 40-acre farm with a fence around it and a farmhouse in the middle. And our responsibility is to make sure that the fence boards are repaired and kept in good order so that Satan doesn't get the idea that he can creep in and make a mess on our 40-acre life. We talked about how important it was to maintain those fence boards with Jesus in control in the house. So this morning we want to look at yet another of Luke's stories. This time we want to learn what we can do, what we can do to keep the devil from doing what he wants to do in our lives. So let's take a look at Luke chapter 11, uh, beginning at verse 14, and see what Luke can teach us about what we can do. Beginning in verse 14, Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. Now, demons can have any number of effects on people. In Scripture, they could cause convulsions. They could cause uh, people to be deaf. In this case, this man was unable to speak because of the influence, the control of the demonic. And by the way, let me remind you that these kinds of stories are the work of the, of the unseen world in the extreme. Uh, it is often not that extreme that we may experience, but it is in the extreme that we can learn the, the backfill, the backstory of what the enemy wants to do. We continue in verse 14. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke... 
and the crowd was amazed. Jesus had reversed what the devil wanted to do in his life. Remember last week we said that no matter what the devil wants to do in our lives, Jesus is stronger. And here he's exhibiting that. Verse 15. But some of them said, By Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking him for a sign from heaven. Now what's happening here is the Pharisees and their scribes are trying to discredit Jesus just like they tried to discredit John the Baptist in in a similar way. They were accusing Jesus of using the prince of demons as his authority for casting out demons. It was a vicious slander, and it would have labeled Jesus an outcast for life. Others, by the same way, were trying to discredit Jesus by asking him, could you please show us proof of your connection to the supernatural? You know, what is your connection to the unseen world that allows you to do this? So Jesus responds to their accusations, and he responds to what they had to say, first, by using logic to answer their accusations. We read in verse 17, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. Jesus is using logic here. He said, it doesn't make sense for Satan to oppose members of his own kingdom. And the hierarchy of demons can't last if they're fighting each other, if they're divided against each other. He follows this this bit of logic with some ironic humor when he says, now if I drive out demons by the prince of demons, Beelzebul, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then they will be your judges. Okay, you say that I'm driving out demons because I'm in cahoots with the prince of demons. Oh, by the way, your followers, your disciples, who who are they using to cast out demons? A little bit of ironic humor. And then Jesus makes his claim. Now, casting out demons was not significant in themselves, in in that act itself, but it was the interpretation where the power comes from. This is why they were asking those questions. Where do you get your power? It's the, it's, that's where the meaning of the casting out of demons comes from. And so Jesus says in verse 20, But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now Jesus is pulling a, a figure of speech, the finger of God, out of the Old Testament. You may or may not remember that when the Egyptians experienced the ten plagues, they attributed it to the finger of God. Later, when the Ten Commandments were written, the Old Testament tells us that those commandments were written down by the finger of God. Now, in today's world, we might say, this has God's fingerprints all over it. And that's what Jesus is saying here. What I'm doing in encountering and defeating the enemy is, this has God's fingerprints all over it. I, Jesus is saying, I am claiming to be God's personal touch. So he's reasserting his claim and his authority over demons as coming from the personal work of God. Then Christ illustrates his point. Verse 21, When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. Now, strong man here is a reference to the devil. He now has, the the literal word here is palace, or or, um, a a, a fortress, where he, he keeps all his goods. And and, and later we will find out that it's really plunder. It's not just what he has, it's what he's taken from from those he's controlled. So he's guarding his place, he's guarding his citadel. Verse 22, but when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. In this story, the stronger one, article at the front, is is a subtle or not so subtle reference to Jesus Christ. That when Jesus Christ, the stronger one, comes, he disarms the enemy, he takes back all the plunder, and redistributes it to his friends, another gospel tells us. So the picture here is that Satan has come and stolen joy and peace and love and contentment from a lot of people, people he's wanted to control or slow down or distract. 
And he's taken all of that from us, and he holds it up in his own citadel, his own palace. And now a stronger one comes, Jesus. He raids the enemy, takes back everything the enemy's stolen from us, and redistributes it to us. That's the story that Jesus Christ is talking about here. Then Jesus implies a question in verse 23. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Now the implied question is this. Having heard what the stronger man, Jesus, can do to a strong man, the devil, whose side do you want to be on? If you're not with me, you're against me. Whose side do you want to be on? It's a decision you have to make. Who do you want to be with? And finally, he concludes his response to their accusations with an explanation of what goes on in the unseen world. Remember, I've said earlier that the Bible is a great authority to understand what's happening in the unseen world. Uh, The Western mind often can't understand that, that part of our reality is seen and part of our reality is unseen. And there's a whole lot of imagination about what happens in the unseen world. The Bible treats the unseen world as real. And uh, if you want to know what, what happens and how the unseen world works, the Bible is a great place to start. So Jesus gives an explanation, beginning in verse 24. When an un- impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. Now, an unclean spirit being tossed out of a person, being kicked off the 40 acres, goes into arid places. And in the Old Testament, the wilderness was considered to be the haunting place of of unclean spirits while they waited assignment. And so that's where they went, waiting assignment. So there's a a man whose, whose home, whose house, farmhouse on the 40 acres has been cleaned. But unfortunately, it may be clean, but it's empty. It may be orderly, but it's unoccupied. And we read in verse 25, when that unclean spirit comes back to this empty house and finds it swept and clean and put in order, then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. Orderly, clean, but empty. That house needed to be filled. Now, one of the understandings in Jesus' ministry days is that when you cast out a spirit, you used a more powerful spirit to cast that spirit out. And then that more powerful spirit comes to occupy the place where that impure spirit had been. And so this empty house was empty, should have been filled with a more powerful spirit. What's that spirit? Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. That's the Spirit the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, not the unholy spirits of the enemy, but the Holy Spirit of God is to fill that clean, orderly place that Jesus has created in our lives. When the Greek language wants to use a tense to tell us something that happens once and for all, it uses the aorist tense, A-O-R-I-S-T, aorist Once and for all. And there are a number of things that happen to a believer once and for all when they accept Jesus Christ as it relates to the Holy Spirit. For instance, we are told in the aorist tense that we are sealed. The guarantee of our relationship to God is given to us once and for all. We're told that when we are initiated into the body of Christ, where Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12, that happens once and for all, the aorist tense. When we are given a mark of ownership, so, we, so the spirit world knows who we belong to. Not the mark of the beast, but the mark of the spirit of God. That's in the aorist tense. That's called being sealed with the spirit. All of these things are in the aorist tense in the New Testament. They happen once and for all. But in Ephesians 5, this verse 18, 
When Paul wants to talk about being filled with the Spirit, he does not use the aorist tense. This is not a once and for all occurrence. He uses the present imperative. The present uh, tense implies that this is, or, or tells us, this is a continuous event. This is an ongoing event in the life of a believer. And as a matter of fact, we see that happening in the history of the early church in the book of Acts. For instance, look at these occasions when Peter is said to have been filled with the Spirit. Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, all of them, Peter among them, were filled with the Spirit. Acts 4, 8, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, as he answered their accusations. Later in Acts 4, when the early church prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a repeating event. Even for the Apostle Paul in Acts, 19, in Acts 9, verse 17, when Ananias meets him, Ananias says this, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may be a, see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. But following that encounter with Ananias in chapter 13, verse 9, then Saul, who's also called Paul, Filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimaeus, who was making some weird statements about what ought to be happening in a Christian's life. Paul was speaking to him filled with the Spirit. The pattern in Acts, beginning at Pentecost, is that the filling of the Spirit is a continuous, ongoing experience in the life of a believer. And for Luke, in the Gospel of Acts, the specific purpose for being filled with the Spirit was power for ministry. There were challenges and new opportunities and open doors, and they needed to be empowered by the Spirit of God for those opportunities. And so in the book of Acts, Luke's purpose is to empower, to show that the Spirit of God empowers the church for ministry. On the other hand, in the, in the letters of Paul, Paul is more interested in the inner life of the believer. And so for Paul, the cause for being filled with the Spirit is for personal holiness, to be, to be clean. He's the one who talks about the fruit of the Spirit, that, that inner life. So in both cases, and, and both are, are true, both for power for ministry and for personal holiness, the filling of the Spirit is not a once and for all event. It's an ongoing event in the life of a believer. In fact, this is the, the image that sometimes happens when people talk about the filling of the Spirit as only, as only a one-time event. They have this idea that we're, we, we have a cup and we need to fill the cup and, and make sure that it doesn't spill. Uh, when Jesus in the John 2 in the wedding at Cana told the servants, fill the jars, that was in the aorist tense. But Paul is not saying in Ephesians 5, fill the jars in the aorist tense. In fact, Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus uses a different image when talking about being filled with the Spirit of God. Look in John chapter 7, uh, beginning at verse uh, 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said with a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. One of the rituals of the feast that Jesus attended was that every day the priest would take a golden pitcher and go to the pool of Siloam, draw water, bring it back, and pour it over the west side of the altar. It, it kind of commemorated God's provision of water in the wilderness, but it also pointed forward to the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophets when they talked about the Spirit of God being poured out on men and women and, and old, old people and, and younger people. Jesus took the opportunity of that visual to say that the Spirit of God in a person's life is like the flowing of rivers of living water. Not a, not a one-time fill, but a flowing in a person's life, continuously occurring. Earlier in John 4, uh, Jesus had implied the same image in his conversation with the woman at the well when he said, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. When I was uh, seven years old, our family moved from Connecticut to Massachusetts. Uh, we sold our home in Connecticut and moved to Massachusetts. My dad was going to become director of a campground there. 
And uh, we started building a house across the street in the, uh, in the Berkshire Mountains uh, of, uh, of western uh, Massachusetts uh, to build, build a, a house on the, across the street from the campground where we could live. Uh, at the time, we had five kids in our family, and uh, so we needed, we needed a house. Well, they, they, they dug out of the side of the hill the, the space where the foundation was going to go in the, in the basement, and then they started digging for a well. Now, our house being built was right next to a graveyard, and there was a comedian on the campground who said that when we struck water, it would be gray because of all the ghosts in the water. Well, as a seven-year-old, it scared me silly. Um, but we had the hardest time hitting water. And, and the, the idea was, you know, some, others joked, oh, you're just going to have to bring buckets from across the street and, and bring them into your house. Well, m my house, my siblings and I, we didn't need to be filling a bucket up heiress tents and bringing it across the street to house. What we needed was a well that sprung up continually, that provided our house continually with water. And the image Jesus is using here, by the way, we never hit water. And, and long story short, God directed us uh, to Florida. <laughs> uh, uh, you can ask me about it later. But the image Jesus is using here is that we're not buckets. There's to be a well dug in our life that, that springs up. This is the image that Jesus uses. He, uh, he agrees with Paul here in Ephesians 5 that the, the work of the Spirit of God is an ongoing flowing of the Spirit of God in our life. Christian author Myron Augsburger tells a story that I think is kind of cute. Whether it's true or not, I think it is, but there was a, a man who was, had troubles, problems in his Christian life. And so he, he went forward uh, at the church altar at one service, and intensely and personally he prayed, Dear God, please fill me, fill me, fill me. And there was a, another Christian brother uh, kneeling next to him who overheard this plead, pleading, and he said, Lord, you can't fill him, he leaks. <laughs> we all leak. We all leak. That's why we need a continual flowing of the Spirit of God in our life. Being filled with the Spirit of God can sound scary to some people. It can feel like some special addictions, uh, addition, some deluxe edition of Christianity. Uh, some version of Christianity that's difficult to attain. And so some people try anything and everything to find the secret. But here in Ephesians 5, Paul uses the present imperative Remember we said that a few moments ago? Present imperative. That's a command. Which means that Paul believes that this flowing with the Spirit, this filling with the Spirit, is, is, is advisable and attainable for every believer. What one person has called it the normal work of the Spirit of God in a believer's life. A.W. Tozer said it this way, There is nothing about the Holy Spirit that is strange or eerie. I believe it has been the work of the devil to surround the person of the Holy Spirit with an aura of strangeness so that the people of God feel that this spirit-filled life is a life of being odd and peculiar and, a bit, and, and being a bit uncanny. It is not abnormal. I admit that it is unusual because there are so few people who walk in the light of it or enjoy it, but it is not abnormal. This is nothing added or extra. The Spirit-filled life is not a special deluxe edition of Christianity. It is part and parcel of the total plan of God for His people. And then I want to say a word about Paul comparing being filled with the Spirit to being drunk with wine. Paul says that being drunk with wine results in debauchery. The word means out of control. The exact opposite of the kind of life the Spirit of God wants to produce in us. After all, do you remember one of the fruit of the Spirit? Self-control. And a healthy, self-controlled life, at least to me, sounds like the best life, which is what Jesus wants for us from the start. Now, there is one question that arises out of this comparison between excessive alcohol drinking and, being, and flowing with the Spirit of God. And that is, which thirst controls you? What are you more thirsty for? The Spirit of God to fill, to flow, to bring you wholeness, to give you that, that best life that He has for us.
Now, unfortunately, in Paul's day, he only had, he had limited metaphors he could choose from to talk about the filling of the Spirit. He chose alcohol and drunkenness. I like to think that maybe if he lived in our day, he might have chosen the Adam. The Adam. Now, uh, what I'm about to share with you is not because I got an A in physics, okay? Uh, physics was not one of my most popular topics, subjects in school. But this much I understand. The universe is made up of atoms. And scientists tell us there's a whole lot of space in atoms. Uh, the nucleus of an atom is, is 100,000 times smaller than, than, the, the, than the atom itself. If, if uh, the, the nucleus were the size of a peanut, the atom would be the size of, of a baseball stadium. D difference in size. But there's, there's space between them. Now, this is hard for us to understand because, you know, we're made up of atoms, but we're pretty, we're pretty firm, we're pretty, we're pretty solid, we're, pre we're pretty hard. But scientists say that in reality, uh, in fact, let me tell you that if, if all the empty space in you was sucked out of you, you'd be the size of a particle of dust. Now, I don't recommend that for a, space, uh, for a weight reduction program, <laughs> but in fact, if the entire human race had all the space sucked out of them, uh, we'd be the size of a large sugar cube. Um, I find that, I, I don't understand that. Like I said, it didn't make an A in physics. Um, but that's, they say, so, so they say that actually, actually there's not really empty space there because that empty space is filled with wave functions and quantum fields. Don't ask me. <laughs> in fact, some scientists think that the, the, the reason that we feel uh, so solid is, is because of the kinetic energy and, and, and bonding energy, kinetic action and bonding energy of things called quarks and gluons. Uh, are you with me so far? <laughs> it sounds like I'm talking about the supernatural, right? Well, let me illustrate it this way. Um, th this is a, an oscillating fan that's, that's uh, not operating right now. And uh, an atom with its electrons is like this, if you can imagine, like this fan. It's still, there's a lot of empty space in there. I could stick my finger, or if one of the, I could stick my finger in here, and, and I wouldn't be hurt, wouldn't be harmed. But when I turn this fan on, suddenly what appeared, does that feel good? To, that what appeared to be empty, the space is now more solid, and I wouldn't dare stick my finger in here, for fear that I would be unfortunately reminded that not everything that looks empty is. So if Paul had used this illustration, all the space in our bodies that don't feel like empty space because of the movement and energy of the electrons, which are like the fan blades, maybe the question would be, whose energy is filling the space in your life? Remember we talked about kicking the impure spirit out and replacing it with a more powerful spirit? It's the spirit of God who wants to inhabit the empty spaces of our body, of our life. Can I, using it as an illustration, with every illustration there are limits, but maybe you can understand that the empty spaces in my life and your life can be flowing with the energy of the spirit of God or being impacted by the energy of the evil one. First John, John wrote these words in 1 John 4, 4. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The energy in the spaces in my life can come from the Spirit of God, the unseen work, the unseen power, the personal power of God, rather than the unseen power of the enemy. So here's our take-home thought. When our life is filled with the Spirit of God, there is no room for the devil to do what he wants to do.
When the energy of the Spirit of God is at work in my life, there's no room, there's no space for the devil to do what he wants to do. One last look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Paul uses a mix of the passive and the active. Literally translated, you know, it means be being filled with the Spirit. It implies there's something God does and there's something we do. Here's what we do. In Mark chapter 9, in another account of Jesus casting out a demon, he says this, I command you, come out of this person and never enter him again. That's the power that Jesus has. And when I am beginning to work on cleaning up my life and asking Jesus to come and put things in order, bring order out of chaos, and make sure my life is not just clean but filled, I say, Jesus, would you please come and tell the enemy to get out of my life and to never enter my life again. He can knock on the door. He can check around the 40 acres looking for a board that might be down of my fence. But Jesus, I'm asking you, because you're stronger than him, I'm asking you to ask, tell the devil to stay off my property. He doesn't belong here. Now, I know there are some people who want to flirt with the devil and get angry at the devil and speak directly to the enemy, and you can in Jesus' name, but understand Jesus is the one who has the power. And I want Jesus to tell the enemy in my life, tell the enemy to get away, tell him to get out, tell him to never come here again. Jesus has the power to do that. That's my responsibility, to ask him to do that. The second thing that I do is to let God know that I want his spirit to be flowing through me. I want his energy in my life. I don't want there to be just empty spaces where an impure spirit can come back and say, oh, it's clean and orderly, but nobody else is here. I think I'll sneak back in and take over. and It'll be worse off than it was before. So Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, don't offer any part of yourself. And let me, let me paraphrase it with our Adam analogy. Don't offer any space in your life to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself, every empty space in your human body, your arms, your legs, your heart, your mind, your emotions, every part of you, all that space that if you were melted down, you'd be in particle dust, all that space, ask the Spirit of God to be flowing through your life now, the changes will come as he works, the fruit of the Spirit grows in your life. But that's where it starts. That's where it begins. Spirit of God, would you be the energy flowing through my life? When you do this, you are not just asking God's Spirit to do something in you. You are also making an announcement to the rest of the unseen world, to the unholy spirits, that you don't want them to have anything to do with you. Jesus Kick them off. Never, never play with me again. Jesus has the power to do that. And you are announcing that that's exactly what you want to have done. That's the power that Jesus has so that those impure spirits don't return and the space in your life that's maybe been unoccupied is now filled, flowing with the Spirit of God. Let's bow together in prayer. Lord, sometimes our Western minds have, have a problem understanding the unseen world, but thank you that Jesus came to throw back the curtain, to show us his power, to show us what ought to be happening in our lives. Thank you for this truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand together with me? And I'd like for us to pray together this prayer. As we do, the prayer team is going to come here to my right. And if you have a need in your life or the life of a friend, they will be here to pray with you. But I'd like for us to say this prayer together and, and make it run through your heart as we ask the Lord to do what he wants to do with us. Next slide, please. Last two slides, Sean. Thank you. Last slide. Thank you. Let's read it together. Dear God, forgive me for allowing sin to rule in my life. 
I want to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. I now yield my heart, my mind, and my body to you. I want the Spirit of God to be filling my life. Thank you for hearing and answering my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.